Good morning. Oh, that was fun. Um, Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though rain that comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand when the rain and floods come and the wind beats against that house. It will collapse, it will collapse with a mighty crash. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks for reading scripture, Natalie. And thank you, Stephen, for doing announcements. Please do those always. Uh, and good morning, Hope Collective. All of the whoop whoops. That was, that was great. In the glossy brochures and real estate ads, the beachfront high rise was known as Ocean Tower. 31 stories of luxury living along the sugar white sands of the Gulf Coast. To developers and capital investors, it was one of the most ambitious, most expensive building projects in the history of Cameron County on the southernmost tip of Texas Rio Grande Valley. But if you were to ask the locals about the project, they would tell you what they remember of the Leaning Tower of South Padre Island. In 2006, construction began on what was supposed to be the tallest and most lavish residential tower on South Padre, a barrier island in the Gulf of Mexico right off the southern tip of Texas. The tower would boast almost 150 luxury condos, each one of them a dream in, counter granite, in granite countertops and Italian marble floors. Panoramas of the Gulf and Laguna Madre, five-star amenities, and seven-figure price tags came standard. On top of this, the entire structure was reinforced with triple-thick concrete cores, allowing it to withstand the storms and the hurricane force winds that were sure to come situated on the Gulf of Mexico. According to the blueprints, everything was perfect. Until they weren't. Two years into construction, cracks appeared in Ocean Tower's main support pillars. The entire 31-story structure began to visibly tilt towards the northwest. Engineers immediately halted construction and went to investigate what was going on. Beneath the high-rising luxury of Ocean Tower was the not-so-terra firma of South Padre Island. Over those two years of construction, 55,000 tons of steel and concrete and marble floors and granite countertops were now compressing the sand and clay soil of the barrier island a little bit more with each passing day. Now, two years later, portions of the building's bottom levels had settled almost a foot and a half. This kind of settling meant that the entire structure was at risk of collapse. Engineers began scrambling for a way to salvage the project. They assured developers and would-be residents that their deposits would be safe, construction was only delayed, everything would be okay in the end. However, as the months wore on and the settling continued and a solution still was not found, the truth became as evident as the tower's northwesterly lean. It was too late. The cost of repairing the foundation was just too high. Even if repairs could be made, there was no guarantee that the building would ever be safe to live in. So before a single resident had moved in and enjoyed those granite countertops, before a single storm even had the chance to test those triple-thick concrete cores, a small crowd gathered for the demolition of the luxury condos that had become the local eyesore. Years of work thousands of hours of labor, hundreds of millions of dollars in investments collapsed into a four-story pile of dust and rebar in under 20 seconds. 
Such is the true story of the Leaning Tower of South Padre Island. To this day, the story of Ocean Tower is shared among engineering firms and architect groups as a sort of cautionary tale. Your blueprints can be solid. Your design can be beautiful. But if your foundation isn't strong enough to bear the weight of what you're trying to build, none of that is going to matter. Whatever it is you're trying to build, you have to be able to trust whatever it is you're building on. So let's talk about what it means that faith is our foundation. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Alex. I am one of the pastors here at the Hope Collective, and you are jumping in with us. We are in the middle of a series called Choosing the Kingdom, the values of Jesus in everyday life. And the question that we're looking at for this series is what does it look like for us as individuals, as families, as a church to make decisions like the things that are important to Jesus are actually important to us too? Because it's our decisions, not the things that we say, but the choices that we make that reveal and expose what we believe about God, what we believe about ourselves, and what we believe about what really matters. And those choices that we make also shape us into the people that we are becoming. So when Jesus invites us to be part of God's kingdom, when we choose the kingdom, when we choose to follow him and live into the reality of who God is, it means learning how to make decisions according to the values of Jesus. What would Jesus do if he were me? And in order to choose what Jesus would choose, though, we have to learn to value what Jesus values, to claim as important the things that Jesus says are actually important. So today we're going to talk about what it means that faith is our foundation. And we're going to look at this well-known story that Jesus told at the conclusion of his most well-known teaching in all of scripture, the Sermon on the Mount. And these verses from Matthew 7, 24 to 27, are where we're going to camp out today. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there or scroll there as the case may be. If you don't have a Bible, the words are going to be on, uh, on the screen behind me. But before we get started, I want to say something about this conversation that may um, cause some questions right off the bat, and that's kind of on purpose. But hopefully by the time we get to the end of this, those questions will be resolved. But here's, here's what we need to talk about. When we talk about faith is our foundation, we are talking less about our faith in God than we are about God's faithfulness towards us. When we have this conversation about faith as our foundation, we are talking less about our faith in God and believing more and like just trying really hard to have faith. We are talking more about God's faithfulness towards us, which are two very different ways of living life. <clears throat> Having faith is not about trying harder or doing better at believing in God. Having faith is about learning to place our trust in the one who has proved himself to be trustworthy. And so... There's a story we need to hear, a truth we need to believe, and a response we're invited to make, all from Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. So a little bit of context. So this three-verse chunk is coming at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' kind of magnum opus. It's his articulation of what it means to live life the way that God intended, something that he referred to as the kingdom of God. And he comes to the end of his teaching by bringing in his listeners to a moment of decision. How are they going to respond to what he's just said about everything from the good life to real righteousness to loving your enemies, all of that, how are they going to respond? Are they going to hear what Jesus has said and actually choose to live into that reality? Or are they going to hear everything that Jesus has said, nod politely, and just keep doing what they're doing? And so we go to Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. And though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds their house right on the sand. And when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. How many of you grew up 
in church, uh, went to Sunday school growing up, and remember this, uh, this song. The wise man built his house upon a rock. The wise man... Okay, yes, I see some nods. Some of you are singing along with me, right? Okay, so this song, this is, this, is a, uh, this is a picture, this is a parable that Jesus told. This is an image that kind of is so visceral, it just kind of gets lodged in our minds. One of the things that we don't often think about, though, is the fact that Jesus is singing this song about floods, and he's not singing a song, he's talking. <laughs> We're singing the song, although, Sermon on the Mount the Musical, someday maybe. <laughs> That's a suggestion. Anybody want to do something with that? You're welcome to. Okay. Anyway, what were we talking about? Great. Faith is our foundation. So Jesus is talking about rain and wind and floodwaters. He lives in a desert. Where does this even come into the imagination of the people that he's talking about? Well, the arid climate of Israel where Jesus lived and taught rain was both a crucial element of survival and incredibly dangerous. Because while the summers could be dry with barely any rain, in the winter months, so much rain could fall so quickly that the rivers would swell and that the bone-dry soil of Israel would be so hard and parched that it couldn't actually absorb all that water as fast as it was falling. Flash floods could wipe away entire villages that were just built on the bone-dry soil of Israel. Any builder looking to lay a strong foundation would have to dig down six, eight, sometimes ten feet to get beneath that dry, dusty soil and sand to the actual bedrock, always at great cost. Jesus was saying that just like a builder would dig down to that bedrock, to be able to have a structure that lasts, living life according to his teaching was like building a home on that solid foundation. When the storms of life, which were sure to come, came and went, your life would still be standing because you had built it on that firm foundation. And coming at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, this final call to action from Jesus was an invitation. It was not, as some of us may hear these words, it was not a threat. Jesus was not saying, do what I say, or you're going to be sorry. You better build your life on me, or else I'm going to send storms and wash away your life, and I'm going to ruin you, okay? So do what I say. Jesus' words are not a threat, and Jesus' words are also not a guarantee of comfort. Jesus did not say, listen to my teaching, follow it, and I'll make sure you have no storms. I will give you my storm-free guarantee. 0% chance of thunderstorms for your entire life. He doesn't say that. Jesus' invitation in these verses is just that, an invitation. Jesus was saying, listen, storms are going to be a part of life. Things are going to happen. Life is not going to be easy, especially if you take the words that I'm saying seriously. But here's what else I can tell you, is that if you come to me, If you listen to my teaching, if you put it into practice, I will make sure that you make it through the storm every single time. According to Jesus, this kind of faith, not just checking Christian on a religious survey or having some vague idea that God probably exists out there somewhere, but this kind of faith that chooses to trust the entire weight of our existence on the person and work and teaching of Jesus and what he says is real, this is the bedrock that God gives us to be the foundation of a life that lasts forever. But here's the problem. Even though we may be familiar with this story that Jesus told, even though the instruction may seem pretty uh, straightforward to some of us, there's a way of hearing and responding to what Jesus says in these three verses that actually stops short of what Jesus intended. And if we're not careful, can actually work against the life that he came to bring us. And so the story that Jesus told that needs to be understood within the context of a truth that we need to believe. Too many people read Matthew 7, 24 to 27, uh, myself being one of them, and end up believing that what Jesus is really interested in is what we do. 
And it's true that Jesus' focus in these three verses is on what we do. It's on how we respond to what he's saying. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it. But these three verses from the Sermon on the Mount need to be understood in the three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus says here needs to be understood in what Jesus has been saying so far. What Jesus says in these three verses is meant to be heard in the context of the revolutionary, upside-down, confusing, comforting, disorienting, inviting words that he's been giving us summarized by the ridiculously compressed phrase, my teaching. Those two words would have been scandalous to Jesus's audience. We miss it. But Jesus in these words is surrounded by thousands of Jewish people from every walk of life, but each one having been instructed from a very young age that their entire life was to be organized around the law of Moses and God's instruction in Torah, interpreted by the rabbis and the Pharisees of the day. It was about God's teaching. It was about Moses' instruction. It was about the Pharisees' teaching, and the Pharisees made sure that everybody knew it. Because they, their message was that if we just do what we're told, everything's going to be fine. So just do what you're told, don't ask questions, and everything's going to be fine. Because you kept the rules. Then Jesus comes on the scene and says, everything that Moses said, Moses' instruction, I'm fulfilling it. Everything that the law and the prophets talked about, they were actually preparing you for me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And I'm not pointing you somewhere else to something else or someone else. I'm coming to you and saying, build your life on me. Jesus' call to action in Matthew 7, 24 to 27 only makes sense if it was a response to his call to himself. It is not a cold set of teachings that we are invited to build our life on. It is the person who taught them whose life expressed them, who modeled them, and whose heart is available to us. But if we're not careful, we read these words from Jesus, and it doesn't sound much different than what the Pharisees were saying back in Jesus' day. Just do what you're told, and everything will be fine. Faith becomes just another exercise in us trying harder. Striving and struggling, because it all depends on us. And if our life with God becomes all about what we do, our ability to love our enemies, our ability to keep our cool, our ability to turn the other cheek, to pray in secret, to do all the things that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, if it's all up to us, after all, it's our faith, all of a sudden the foundation of our life with God has nothing to do with what Jesus has done. And it has everything to do with what we do. Or don't. But the faith that we're invited to make the foundation of our life isn't actually ours. The faith we're invited to make the foundation of our life is God's. In the language of scripture, the words that get translated as faith are the same words that get translated as faithfulness, trust, and trustworthiness. In Hebrew, the word that gets translated as faithfulness is emet. It carries the idea of something that is stable and steady and reliable. It's something that you can count on to be there when you need it and not collapse as soon as you put a little bit of pressure on it. It's a firm foundation. It's sure footing. It's solid ground. To put your faith in something or to have faith in something simply means to act like the thing that you're trusting can actually be trusted. It's something that's going to provide what it promises. It's something that's going to deliver. It's something that's going to be there for you. You are treating that thing like it's reliable, like it's faithful, like it's stable. But here's the thing is your willingness to trust the thing that you're trusting doesn't change the fact of whether or not that thing can be trusted. Either you can trust it or you can't. Your trust in the thing doesn't change the trustworthiness of the thing. Everybody with me? <laughs> Let's do this. If you're able, I'm going to invite everyone in this room to stand. And right off the bat, I'm asking you to stand. We're talking about trust. There are some of you in this room that are like, oh, no. We better not be playing some group game. I will leave this church so fast. And listen, hey, hey, it's okay. I would not do that to you, okay? 
you can trust me, we're not going to do that. There are two types of people in this world. There are people who do not like spontaneous groups games, and there are people who are wrong. <laughs> and there is space here for everyone, okay? So thank you, we we're all invited to this. But listen, you came into this space today, and whether you know it or not, you committed an act of petty trust, petty faith, because you came into this room and you may not have even thought about it, you picked a chair and you sat down in that chair. You put your trust in that chair. You believed that that chair would provide what it promised without even thinking about it. So, great faith. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to sit down, but before I do, I need to tell you that your chair that you have trusted for this entire service does not exist. You only thought that that chair existed. That chair actually isn't there. While you've been looking forward, the people in the back rows have actually been clearing the chairs out of this room. The, the chairs aren't there. The person behind you is actually gonna pull it out as soon as I say that you can sit down. There are actually some trick chairs in this room, prank chairs, that when you go to sit down, it's just gonna fall out from under you. Now please take a seat. How many of you were like? <laughs> yes. Nothing that I said about your chair changed whether or not your chair was trustworthy. It may have changed your experience. It may have changed how you felt. You may have been uncomfortable. You may have been nervous. And those feelings are real, but those feelings do not shape reality. Even when we have a hard time putting our faith in God, that does not change whether or not God is trustworthy. When we show our faith in God, we are just responding to our understanding of the trustworthiness of God. We are living into the reality of God's faithfulness. We are acting on our belief that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he's going to do. We listen to the words of Jesus and we put them into practice, not because we think that it's a good idea, but because we believe that him and his teaching and his way of approaching life that flows from his understanding of who he was and who God was, those are actually the firm foundations because they're built on the faithfulness of God to us. That when all is said and done, the only things that make it through the storms are the things that are built on his character and promises because his character and promises do not end and do not change. That's why these words of Jesus in Matthew 17, 20 are such a comfort. If, when Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the absolute smallest frame of reference that was available to Jesus and his audience at the time, if you have faith that is the smallest amount that you could possibly conceive of, if it exists in any amount whatsoever, that is enough to move mountains because it's not actually about how much faith you have. It's about how faithful God is. And so if we want to live out this value of faith as our foundation, it's not about trying harder. It's not about doing better. It's not about saying, I just have to have more faith. Eee! That's not how it works. <laughs> it's about becoming more familiar with the character and promises of God and learning to live into the reality that God can be trusted. And so the story that Jesus told and this truth that we need to believe brings us to a response that we're invited to make. When we say faith is our foundation, the focus is less on our faith in God and more on God's faithfulness towards us. And the only reason we can put our trust in God in the first place is because he's proved himself to be trustworthy. And the ultimate expression of that is Jesus. And so our decision to listen and follow Jesus' teaching is the direct result of our understanding of how God has revealed himself and his character and promises through the person and work of Jesus. I want to read some scripture, and I want you to follow the line of thought here. Jesus says, those who come to me and who listen to my teaching and who put it into practice, those are the ones who have built their lives on a firm foundation. 
He says in John 14, 21, those who accept my commandments and obey them, other words for listen and put them into practice, those who accept my commandments and obey them, those are the ones that love me. You can tell the people who truly love Jesus because they listen to his teaching and they put it into practice because it's his teaching and they love him. You're never going to meet a person who's like, I love Jesus. Okay, who is Jesus to you? I don't know. I'm sure he said some stuff. He, he might be great, but I'm not really living like it and I don't really spend time with him, but love the guy, he's great. That's not the type of love that Jesus is talking about. Those who accept my commandments and obey them, those are the ones that you can tell they love me. But why do we love God? First John 4, 19, we love God because he first loved us. How do we know that God loved us? Romans 5, 8, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners, while we were still enemies and opposed to God. God sent his one and only son to die for us. How do we know that this is love? John 15, 13, Jesus says, there is no greater love than for one to lay down his life for his friends. Our decision to put our faith in God is the direct result of our understanding of God's love for us in Jesus. And the more we understand what he has done and what he's like and what he's done, the more we come to love him and the more we come to love him, the more of our life we come to build on that firm foundation of the character and promises of God because we've seen it in its fullness in the person and work of Jesus. So what do we do? How do we respond? Romans 8, 31 to 32. What can we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Romans 8, 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons, neither fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what do we do? Romans 10, 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. It's not about how much we trust God. It's about how much God can be trusted. And so here's the invitation. It's one thing to just talk. It's another thing for us to create space to allow the Holy Spirit to invite us into a moment of how much he wants to remind us that he can be trusted. So we are going to spend the rest of our time together reminding ourselves of the faithfulness of God. So I'm going to invite you to stand up again. Still no group games, okay? I'm going to invite you to stand. And I'm going to invite the band to make their way up here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a few minutes where I'm just going to read from Scripture over us some of the promises that God gives us in Scripture. Promises that express his character, his love, and his faithfulness towards us. The team's going to lead us in a couple of songs afterwards, celebrating God's faithfulness and declaring how good and how much he can be trusted. That's the invitation to all of us in this room is to spend the next 10 minutes reflecting on God's goodness towards us, where he's been faithful in our lives, and have these songs and these scriptures remind us of who God is and his great love for us. But there's another group of people in this room that when we talk about the storms of life, uh, that is not a hypothetical for you. That is a lived reality right now. And if that's you in the room, I'm just gonna invite you to raise your hand and say, you know what? There are storms that I'm in the middle of right now and it's just hard. And I just need this reminder of who God is and what he's done and his faithfulness towards me. I am raising my hand, by the way, not as like modeling, but like, hey, me too, actually.
And for some of us in this room, just raising a hand doesn't really go deep enough to what we actually need. And we need this movement. We need to express, we need to do with our bodies what we want to happen with our souls is to make a move towards God. And if that's you in this room, I'm gonna invite you to take the bold step of just coming forward. We've removed this first row of chairs and just made room at the altar because we know that the storms of life are real. And we wanna make this space where we can come forward and respond to God's invitation. If that's you in the room, I'd invite you to come forward right now, come forward as the band plays and just make that time between you and God here to be reminded of the faithfulness that he has towards you as we read these scriptures, as we sing these songs. And God, as we read these promises, would you tear down every part of our lives that has not been built on the solid rock? And may you give us the confidence that we need to say yes to trusting Jesus, to trust you with our work, to trust you with our families, to trust you with our futures, to trust you with our hurts, to trust you with our relationships, to trust you with every single aspect of our lives. Would you help us to build our lives on that firm foundation of your faithfulness towards us? And so we read these promises from God. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all of this by coming to know him, the one who has called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. Like Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you or forsake you. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. 1 John 1, 9, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new creation. The old is gone. A new life has begun. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. James 1, 5, if you need wisdom, ask. And our generous God, he will give it to you and he will not rebuke you for asking. Matthew 7, 7 to 8, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds and everyone who knocks, the door will be open to them. Matthew 6, 33. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. John 3, 17, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. John 10, 28 to 29, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else and no one can snatch them from the father's hand. John 14, 2, 
than three. There is more than enough room in my father's house. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come to get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1, 20, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I am coming soon. And Matthew 28, 20. Behold, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. Holy Spirit, remind us Remind us of who you are. Remind us of your goodness towards us. We love you. We love you.
fear till they sing Fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Fear you never conquer me I belong to Jesus Fear you never conquer me I belong to Jesus Oh, fear you never conquer me I belong to Jesus. I put my faith in Jesus. He's my anchor to the ground. My hope and firm foundation He'll never let me down I put my faith in Jesus He's my anchor to the ground You're my hope and firm foundation God is for us. Who can ever be against us? Nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the power of hell itself can separate us from God's love. So let us hold unswervingly to this hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. band's going to stay up for just a few more minutes and play. This is a dismissal.
But if this is a space where you feel like you need to spend some time, if you need to pray, if you need to stay, do that. This is your official dismissal. We love you, Hope Collective. We will see you here next Sunday.